There are not many animated videos about the wavelet transform out there, which is unfortunate because the concept of wavelet is much easier to understand once clearly visualized. The wavelet transform is similar to the Fourier transform that you are probably more familiar with. But while the Fourier transform uses a sinusoidal base to decompose a signal, wavelet transforms use a wider diversity of bases, often less regular than sinuses. If you are interested in three blue and brown videos, you might have come across these drawings so satisfying to watch, that uses vectors rotating at a constant speed. I am not going to go into details about them, I let you a link to the video in the description. To summarize, these drawings are based on the Fourier transform. As you can see, the formula is a sum of complex exponentials. The function of the real x, exponential ix, draws a circle in the complex plane. Therefore, the complete formula, which is a sum of complex exponentials, represents a sum of rotating vectors. Now that we know we can draw with the Fourier transform, we would like to go further and ask the question, how can we draw in a similar way using the wavelet transform? To introduce the wavelet transform, we are going to start with a simple example. You can see here a signal composed of 16 points. We would like to transform this signal into a simpler one, with all information more condensed. A possible solution is to take the points 2 by 2 and to compute the mean value of each pair. We start with the first two points at 8 and 6, and we obtain a new value, 7, that we store. to the next pair and reiterate the process, and then to the third pair, and so on until the end. We now have 8 red points left. They represent a rough approximation of the initial signal. We divided our number of points by 2. But this approximation raises an issue. We can't go back to the original signal. We have lost information in the process. That's why, instead of storing only the mean value of each pair, we are also going to store the difference between the first point of a pair and the mean value. By definition of the mean, we know that the difference between that value and the second point will be the same. Thus, we don't need to store it twice. You can note that when the first point of the pair is below the mean, the value stored is negative. You can also notice that the value stored is zero when the two points of a pair are identical. Computing this difference for each pair, we now have a total of 16 points, as we had at the beginning, spread into two different signals. The first one, in red, represents an approximation of the original signal, while the other one, in green, represents what misses the first one to match the original signal. We talk about approximation space and detail space. You can see that no information was lost in the process. We can rebuild our original signal using the two sub-signals we've just computed. To do so, we take a point in the approximation space and we place it on our graph. Then we take the corresponding point in the detail space and we add it to the point we've just placed on the graph to get back the original first point of the signal. 
The second point is easily computed by symmetry. And here we are. We computed how first wavelet transform followed by an inverse transform. It uses hard bases to decompose the signal. This wavelet transform is the most simple one. But we are not going to stop there. Once we've completed the first transform, why not try another transform on the new approximation space, giving an even more approximative signal with a new detailed space completing it. And again. And again. As we continue to apply transforms, we are compressing the important information of the signal into a smaller and smaller space. We talk about the depth or the level of a transform. To illustrate what a multi-level transform looks like, here is another example. We now have a signal of 8 values, but instead of representing them with dots, we are going to represent them with a step function, with each step representing a value. You will understand later the point of this representation. As before, we compute our transformation. The approximation space represents a new step function with half as many steps as the original one. And the new detail space is also composed of four values, representing the differences between the steps of the approximation space and the steps of the original signal. We can now compute a second transform. That leaves us with two steps for the approximation function. The two values in the detail space are the differences between these two steps and the four steps of the previous approximation function. And finally, we can compute our last transformation. The approximation space is now composed of only one value. This value represents the mean value of the wall signal. As you can see, as we move toward the right in our table, in other words, as we move toward more detailed spaces, values are becoming smaller and smaller. This was the aim of the wavelet transform, compress the information into a small space. To do the inverse transform, we need to go backward. To do so, we are going to use two functions, the scaling function and the wavelet function. These functions are characteristic of a specific wavelet transform and differ between them. For the R transformation, here is how they look. The scaling function will be used to reconstitute the approximation space and the wavelet function will be used to reconstitute the detail spaces. We will start from the deepest transformation we computed. First of all, we need to get our approximation space back. So we take the scaling function and we place it on the graph. As the coefficient we've got in the approximation space is 4, we scale our function by 4. This is the first stage of our inverse transformation. Now, we need to use the next value in the table which is a tree. As it is in a detail space, we need to use the wavelet function. As before, we place it on the graph and scale it by tree. Then we just add this function to the one we had before and we get a new function with two steps. We can now move to the second detail space. This one is composed of two values. Therefore, we will need to use two wavelet functions. The first one will be used for the first half of the signal, the second one for the second half. You can see that a negative coefficient flips the function in order to get the first new step going down. And here we are, how second detail space is now represented. We still have a last detail space composed of four values. 
So we will use four wavelets functions, each one spreading on a quarter of the signal. And finally we've done. We've got our original signal back. You could wonder, what if we would have started with a less deep transform? Well, it would have been exactly the same, but instead of using only one scaling function, we would have used more. You can try by yourself and see that we obtain exactly the same results. Until now, we've only talked about the R basis. But what about other bases? Other bases are more complex, less regular, and harder to understand. But they also allow more precise approximations. One famous wavelet family is the Debussy's wavelets. Here you can visualize the scaling function and the wavelet function of the Debussy's two wavelets. These are quite more complex than the R1s, aren't they? But the idea is the same. The scaling function is used to visualize the approximation space and the wavelet functions, the detail spaces. All these transforms are great to approximate real signals. But what about complex signals? Our objective is to make them draw shapes. Drawing shapes on the real axis isn't very interesting. But moving to the complex plane, we can draw much more interesting shapes as we have now two dimensions available. Then, how to use a wavelet transform on a complex signal? Well, using a complex wavelet. Fortunately, some complex wavelet families already exist, even if they are not used a lot. The wavelet we are going to use are named complex Debussy's wavelets, and they are based on a scientific paper released in 1993 by Jean-Marc Lina and Michel Méran. Now that we are dealing with complex wavelets, how scaling and wavelet functions have a real and an imaginary part. Seeing these parts separately is interesting, but we would like to see what they look like in the complex plane. We can plot them as we would plot a parametric function. Here is a scaling function. As both real and imaginary parts have an identical symmetry axis, the function looks like a single line as the dot is following the path it has already traced. This function looks like a weighed hook. The wavelet function resembles more a kind of butterfly maybe. You can see whatever you want. But the point is that I can now decompose the complex function in the complex basis. And once decomposed, I can recompose it using the scaling and wavelet functions we've just seen, just summing them as we did before with the R transform. And here it is. We can first see the scaling functions in red, then in blue, we have our first detail space with wavelet functions, then another detail space with again wavelet functions, and another one, and another one. Finally, you can see those white vectors attached to each function. They are going to follow it, with each vector on top of the previous one. And finally, the sum of all these vectors will give us the original complex signal that we decomposed. I am now going to hide the functions to only show the vectors and declutter a bit the scene. Of course, the result might be less beautiful than what we obtain with the Fourier transform. Circles are something we are familiar with. This is not the case of those weighed functions. However, the idea behind this visualization is exactly the same as the Fourier visualization. A sum of simple complex functions, drawing a more complicated shape in the complex plane. 
I hope that you liked this introduction to wavelet transforms. I voluntarily summarized and simplified a lot of concepts to keep things comprehensible for most people. But if you were interested, I encourage you to go further by yourself on the subject. There is a lot more to say about it. Thank you and goodbye.